members of the Venezuelan opposition rally blocking the main highway in Caracas. Isn't something that conjures up the possibility of going on a vacation to a faraway place? <laughs> No, Planned Parenthood includes sexualizing young girls through the Girl Scouts. The vast majority of abortions are matters of lifestyle. The bulk of abortions are worth a woman impregnated through rape should accept that horribly created gift. The gift of human life, except what God has given you. Syria says one of its military air bases has been attacked. Russia has once again more President human rights. President Trump says he will decide how to respond to this weekend's deadly chemical attacks in Syria. The Iraqis are living among the President Bush calls human rights and international affairs.
sword of Mars, and that he feels Lucian like how she famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. <laughs> but, but pardon, gentles all, the flat unraised spirit that hath dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O oh, the very cast that did affright the air at Agincourt? Please, let us cyber to this great house. house. On your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchs. Whose high up reared in the budding fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. The piece out our imperfections with your thoughts. And into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary battle. Picture when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hooves in the receiving earth. For it is your thoughts. But now must deck our king, carry them here and there, jumping or tied. Turning the accomplishments of many years into an hourglass. For the wish of God, and may not to this history. New prologue life, your humble patience pray. Gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. <laughs> <laughs> Eli, I'll tell you that self bill is urged, which in the eleventh year of the last king's reign was like. And had indeed against us passed that the scambling and unquiet time to push it out of further question. But how Canterbury shall we now resist? It must be thought on. If it pass against us, we lose the better half of our possession. All the valued lands that they strip from us. For what prevention? The king is full of grace and very large. Oh, a true lover of the holy church. The courses of his youth promise it not. <laughs> the breath no sooner left his father's body but that his wildness mortified in him seemed to die too. At that very moment, consideration like an angel came and whipped the offending Adam out of him. For your blessed in this change. Hear him put reason and divinity, and all admiring with an inward wish, you would desire the king were made a prelate. This is this course of war, you would say it hath been all in all his study. Hear him debate of commonwealth affairs, you shall hear a fearful battle rendered you in reason. But how now for the mitigation of this bill urged by the commons? Doth his majesty incline to it or no? He seems indifferent. Or rather sway more upon our part than cherishing the exhibitors against us. For I have made an offer to his majesty, which I have opened to his grace at large, as touching France, to give a greater sum than ever at one time the clergy yet did do his predecessors part with all. How seem this offer received, my lord? With good acceptance of his majesty, save that there was not time enough to hear. What was the impediment that broke this off? The French ambassador upon that instant craved audience. And the hour, I think, has come to give her hearing. I long to hear it. Where is my gracious lord of Canterbury? Shall I call in the ambassador, my liege? Not yet, Westmoreland. We would be resolved before we hear him some things of weight that task our thoughts concerning us and Frank. God and his angels guard your sacred throne and make you long become it. Surely we thank you, my learned lord, and we pray to proceed and justly and religiously unfold by the Salic law that they have in France that says that no, no woman shall inherit land, land, or should or should not bar us in our claim. And God forbid, my dear and faithful lord, that you fashion, rest, or bow your readings, who suits not the native colors of the truth. For God doth know how many know in hell shall drop their blood in approbation to what your reverence shall incite us to. Therefore, take heed in how you upon our person, how you awake our sleeping sword of war. King Pepin's title and Hugh Capet's claim, King Lewis's satisfaction all appear to hold and right and title of the female. So do the kings of France and to this day, how beat they would hold up this Salic law and bar your highness claiming from the female, and rather choose to hide them in a nest and amply to and bar their crooked titles usurped from you and your progenitors. May I with right and conscience make this claim? The sin upon my head, dread sovereign, for in the book of Numbers it is writ, when the man dies, let the inheritance descend unto the daughter. Gracious Lord. Stand for your own, unwind your bloody flag, look back into your mighty ancestors. Go, my dread lord, to your great grandsire's tomb, from whom you claim. Invoke his warlike spirit, and your great uncles, Edward the Black Prince, who on the French grounds played a tragedy, 
making defeat on the full power of France, while his most mighty father on a hill stood smiling to behold his lion's well poured in blood of French nobility. Awake remembrance of these valiant dead, and with your powerful arm renew their feats. You are their heir, you sit upon their throne. The blood and courage that was renowned in them runs in your veins. And by Christ's gracious Lord, is it the very mainmorn of his youth? Right for exploits and mighty enterprises. Your brother kings and monarchs do all expect that you should rouse yourself as did the former lions of your blood. They know your grace have cause and means in might, so hath your highness. Never king of England had nobles richer or more loyal subjects, whose hearts have left their bodies here in England and like pavilioned in the fields of France. Oh, let their bodies follow, my dear liege, with blood and sword and fire to win your right. In aid whereof we of the spirituality will raise your highness such a mighty sum as never did the clergy at one time bring into any of your ancestors. We must not only arm to invade the French, but we must lay down our proportions against the Scotch, who may rode upon us with all advantages. They, of those marshes, gracious sovereign, shall be a wall sufficient to defend our inland from the pilfering border. I do not mean the coursing snatchers only, but fear the main intendment of the Scotch, who have been a giddy neighbor to us. You will read that my great-grandfather never went with his forces into France, but that the Scots on his unburnished kingdom came in like a tide into the breach. There's a saying very old and true that if France you will win with Scotland first begin. Therefore to France, my liege, divide your happy England into four, whereof take you one quarter into France, and you with all shall make all the Lee ashamed. If we, with thrice such numbers left at home, cannot defend our own doors from the Scots, let us be worried, and our nation lose the name of hardiness and policy. Call the messenger sent from the Dauphin. Now are we well resolved, and by God's grace and yours, the noble sinews of your power, friends being ours, will bend it to our arm, break it all to pieces. Now are we well prepared to know the pleasure of our fair cousin Dauphin. For we hear your breathing is from him, and not from the king. May it please your majesty to give us leave freely to render what we have in charge, or shall we sparingly show you far <laughs> off the Dauphin's meaning and our embassy? <laughs> we are no tyrants, but a Christian king, unto whose grace is our passion as is our wretches, <clears throat> fettered in our prison. Therefore, with frank and uncurbed plainness, tell us the Dauphin's mind. Thus then in view, your highness, lately sending into France, did you claim some certain dukedoms in the right of your great predecessor, King Edward III, in answer of which claim the prince, our master, says that you savor too much of your youth? And may you be advised, there's not in France that cannot be without a nimble galliard one. He therefore sends you, meter for your spirit, this ton of treasure, and in lieu of this, desires you let the dukedoms that you claim hear no more of you. This is the Dauphin speaks. What treasure, uncle? <laughs> Tennis balls, my lady. <laughs> <laughs>
His mock, mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers from sons, mock castles down. Tell them no fall that his jest will save her but of shallow wit, and thousands more weep than did laugh at it. Convey them with safe conduct. Fare you well. This was a merry message. We hope to make the thunder blush at it. Therefore, my lords, will be no happy hour that shall give furtherance to our expedition. For now we have no thought in us but France, save those to God that run before our business. Therefore, let our proportions for these wars be soon collected in anything with reasonable swiftness that shall add feathers to our wings. For God before will chide this dauphin at his father's door. Therefore, let every man now task his thought that this fair action may on foot be brought. Now, all the youth of England are on fire, and silken dalliance in the wardrobe lies. Now thrive the honor, and honor's thought reigns solely in the breast of every man. They sell the pasture now to buy the horse, following the mirror of all Christian kings with winged heels as English Mercury. For now, sits expectation in the air, and hides a sword from hilts upon the point, with crowns, imperial crowns, and coronets. Promise to Harry. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Promise to Harry and his followers. Ahem, the French, advised by good intelligence of this most dreadful preparation, shaken their, their fear. fear, and with pale policy <laughs> seek to divert the English purposes. Oh, England, modeled to thy inward greatness, like little body, with a mighty heart. What might thou do that honor would thee do? Were all thy children kind and natural. But see, thy fault France hath in thee found out, a nest of hollow bosoms, which he filled with treacherous crowns, and three corrupted men, one, Richard, Earl of Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> and the second, Henry, Lord Scroop of Masham. <laughs> and the third, Sir Thomas Gray, Knight of Northumberland. The world! <laughs> For the guilt of France. Oh, guilt indeed! Confirmed conspiracy with fearful France. And by their hands, this grace of kings must die. If hell and treason hold their promises, ere he take leave for France, and in Southampton, linger your patience on, and we will digest the abuse of distance. Force a play. The sum is paid. The traitors are agreed. The king is set from London, and the scene is transported to Southampton. There is the playhouse now. There must you sit. And thence to France shall we convey you safe, charming the narrow seas to give you gentle pass. <laughs> For, if we may, we will not offend one stomach with this play. Till the king come forth, and not till then, unto <laughs> Southampton do we shift our seat. <laughs> well met, Corporal Mim. Good morrow, Lieutenant Bartle. What, are ancient pistol and you friends yet? For my part, I care not. I say little, but when time shall serve, there shall be smiles. I dare not fight, but I will wink and hold on mine iron. It's a simple one, but what though? It will toast cheese and will dirk hold the man's sword will, and there's an end. I will bestow a breakfast to make you friends, and will be all three sworn brothers to France. Let it be so, <coughs> good Corporal Nim. Faith, I will live so long as I may, and that's the certain of it. And when I not live any longer, I will do as I may. That is my rest is the rendezvous of it. It is certain, Corporal, that he is married to Nell quickly. <gasps> And certainly she did you wrong, for you were troth plight to her. I cannot tell. Things must be as they may. Men may sleep and they may have their throats about them at that time. And some say knives have edges. I cannot tell. Here comes ancient Pistol and his wife. Good corporal, be patient here. How oh, now, my host Pistol? Face tight, call some host. Now I swear I scorn the term. Nor shall my nail keep lodgers. No, by my troth, not now. For we cannot lodge and board a dozen or fourteen gentlewomen who live honestly by the prick of their needles. But it will be thought we keep a body house straight. Oh, well, Sharon, if he oh, you are oh, a And in thy hateful lungs, 
yea, in thy stomach, and, which is worse, within thy nasty mouth, I do retort the solo in thy bowels. Frag and take, and flashing fire will follow. I am Lucifer, you cannot conjure me. <laughs> I have a humor to not do indifferently well, and that's the humor. Oh, a hound of great! Thinks thou my spouse beget? Oh, braggart, vile, and damned, furious white, the grave doth gape, and doting death is near. Therefore, exhale! Hear me! Hear me! What I was at my side drug one time or another, and that's the humor of it. Go for that gorge! That is the word I defy thee again! Um, shall I make you two friends? We must to France together. You'll pay me the eight shillings in one of your bedding. <laughs> Slave that pays. Then now I will have, and that's the humor of it. As manhood shall compound. Pasha! Corporal Nim! And thou wilt be friends, be friends. And thou wilt not? Why then be enemies with me too? Pretty put up. A noble shalt thou have. And present pay and liquor likewise will I give to thee, and friendship shall combine in brotherhood. I will live by Nim, and Nim shall live by me, and not distrust, for I shall settler be into the camp, and profit will accrue. Give me thy hand. I shall have my noble. In cash, most justly paid. Well, then that's the new God, his grace is bold to trust these traitors. They shall be apprehended by and by. How smooth and even me. To bear themselves under his allegiance and above himself, grounded with faith and constant loyalty. The king hath note of all that they intend by interception, which they dream not of. Now sits the wind fair, and we will aboard. My lord of Cambridge, and my kind lord of Masham, and you, my gentle knights, give me your thoughts. Think you not that the powers we bear with us will cut their passage through the force of France, for which we in head have assembled them? No doubt, my liege, if each man do his best. I doubt not that, since we are well persuaded. We carry not a heart with us from hence that grows not in the fair kitchen of ours, nor leave not one that doth not wish success and conquest be within them. No monarch was better feared nor loved than is your majesty. True, those that were your father's enemies have steeped their gals in honey and do serve you with Christ's crate of duty and of zeal. We therefore have great cause to thank them. So service shall with steeled sinews toil, and labor shall refresh itself with hope. To do your grace incessant services. You judge no less. Uncle Baxter, enlarge the man committed yesterday that railed against our person. We consider it was an excess of wine that set him on, and on the more advice we pardon. Let him be punished, sovereign, lest example breathe by his sufferance more of such a kind. Oh, let us be merciful. So may your highness, and yet punished too. Oh, sir, you show great mercy to give him life, after the taste of much correction. Alas, for too much love and care of me are at heavy orisons against this poor wretch. If little faults proceeding on this tipper shall not be weak that, how will we stretch our eye when capital crimes, too swallowed and digested, appear before us? We'll yet enlarge this man, though Cambridge scrub and great in their dear care and tender preservation of our person would have him punished. Now, to the French causes, who are the late commissioners? I won, my lord. Your highness did me ask for today. So did you meet, my lady. And I, my royal sovereign. Then Richard, Earl of Cambridge, there is yours. There are yours, Lord Scroop of Mash Minster Knight. Grey of Northumberland, the same as yours. Read them and know I know your worthiness. <laughs> My Lord of Luxor and Uncle of Exeter will go aboard tonight. Why? How now, gentlemen? What read you in those papers? Look you, how they drink. Their cheeks are paper. Why, what see you in those papers that have so cowered and chased your blood out of appearance? No! No! I do confess my fault. I have submit myself to your highness's mercy. What do I do? The mercy that was quick in us but late by your own counsels pressed and killed. You must not dare for shame to speak of mercy. Your own reasons turn into your bosoms as dogs upon their masters worrying you. See you, my princes and noble peers, these English monsters, who for a few crowns have sworn into the French practices to kill us here in Southampton. Tis so strange. Treason and murder! Showman dutiful, why so didst thou? Seem they grave and learned, why so didst thou? Come they from a noble family, why so didst thou? See 
you may be religious, why so didst thou? I will weep for thee, for this revolt me thinks is like another fall of man. Their faults are open. Arrest them to the answer of the law, and God acquit them of their practices. I arrest all of thee of high treason. Our purposes God justly hath discovered, and I repine my fault more than my death, which, which I beseech your highness to forgive. For me, the gold of France did not seduce. <laughs> Although I admit it as a motive, the sooner to effect what I intended, but God be thanked for prevention, which I and suffered partly to be good, beseeching God and you to pardon me. <laughs> Never did faithful subject more rejoice at the discovery of most dangerous treason than I do at this hour enjoy over myself, for it's from a damned enterprise my fault, but not my body, part of the sovereign. God put you in his mercy, for your sentence. You have conspired against our royal person, joined with an enemy proclaimed, and from his coffers received the gold earnest of our death, where you would have sold your king to slaughter. His princes and his peers to servitude, his subjects to oppression and contempt, and his whole kingdom to desolation. Touching our person, seek we no revenge. But we, our kingdom's safety, must so tender, whose ruin you have sought that to her laws we can deliver you. Get you, therefore, hence, poor miserable wretches, to your death. The taste whereof, God give you patience to endure, and true repentance for all your dear offenses. Bear them hence. Now, Lords, France, the enterprise whereof shall be to you as less like glorious. We doubt not now of fair and lucky war, since God so graciously hath brought this dangerous treason lurking in our path. We doubt not now, but every rub smooth in our way. And forth, dear countrymen, let us deliver our influence into the hand of God, putting it straight into expedition, cheerily to see the signs of war advance. No king of England, not king of France. Prithee, honey, sweet husband, let me bring thee to stains. No. For my manly heart doth earn. Bardolph? Be blithe, Nim, rouse thy vaunting veins, and bristle thy courage up. Shall we shog the heel of the god from Southampton? Come, what's the word? <coughs> My love, give me thy lips. Look to my chattels and my movables. Let senses rule. The word is pitch and pay. Trust none, for oaths are straws. Men's fates are wafer cakes. And hold fast is the only dog, my duck. Yoke fellows in arms, let us to France, like horse leeches, my boys, to suck, to suck the very blood, to suck. Touch her soft mouth and march. Farewell, hostess. I cannot kiss, but that is the humor of it. But how slight for you here? Keep close, I do command. Farewell. I do. <laughs> Harry's 
strong, and princes look you strongly armed to meet him. The kindred of him hath been fleshed upon us, and he is born out of that bloody strain that did haunt us in our familiar past. Witness the too much memorable shame when Cressy battle fatally was struck, and all our princes captive by the hand of Edward the Third, Black Prince of Wales. This is a stem of that victorious stock, and let us fear the native mightiness and fate of him. The Duke of Exeter from the English King doth pray admittance to your majesty. We'll give them present audience. Go and bring them. See, this chase is hotly followed, friends. Turn head and stop pursuit, for coward dogs most spin their mouths from what they seem to threaten runs far before them. Good, my sovereign. Take up the English short and show them of what a monarchy you are the head of. Self-love, my liege, is not so vile a sin as self-neglecting. From our brother of England. From him, and thus he greets your majesty, he wills you in the name of God Almighty that you divest yourself and lay part of our glory that by gift of heaven, by law of nature, by everything so before belongs to him and to his heirs, namely the crown, and all wide stretched honors that pertain by ordinance and custom of the time and to the crown of France. He sends you this most memorable line. And every branch truly demonstrative, willing you overlook this pedigree, and when you find him evenly derived from his most famed of famous ancestors, Edward the Third, he bids you then resign the crown, indirectly held from him, the native and true challenger. Or else what follows? Bloody concern. For if you hide the crown even in your hearts, there will be great for you. Therefore, in fierce tempest is he coming, in thunder and in earthquake, like a Job, who, if requiring fail, he will compel and bids you, in the bowels of the Lord, deliver up the crown, and to take mercy on the poor souls for whom this hungry war opens his vasty jaws and on your head, turning the widow's tears, the orphan's cries, the privet maiden's groans, the dead men's blood, for husbands, fathers, and betrothed lovers that shall be swallowed in this controversy. This is his claim, his threatening, and my message. Unless the Dauphin be here, to whom expressly I bring greeting to. <laughs> For us, we will consider of this further. Tomorrow shall you bear our full intent back to our brother of England. For the Dauphin! I stand here for him. What to him from England? Scorned to find slight regard, contempt, and anything that may not misbecome the center doth he prize you at? Thus says my king. And if your majesty's highness do not, in grant of all demands at large, sweeten the bitter mock you sent his majesty, He'll call you so hot an answer of it that the caves and boomy vaultages of France shall chide your trespass and return your mock and second accent of his ordinance. Say if my father render fair return, it is against my will. For I desire nothing but odds with England, as matching to that and to his youth and vanity. It was I who did present him with the Paris ball. You'll make your Paris in shape for it, or the mistress court of my Europe. And you, his subjects, shall find, as we, his subjects, have in wonder found, the difference between the promise of his greener days and these he masters now. Now, he waits time even to the utmost grain. That you shall read your losses if you stay in France. Tomorrow shall you know our mind at full. Dispatch us with all haste, lest that our king come here and question our delay. For he is footed in this land already. He shall be soon dispatched with fair conditions, a night's but small breath and little pause to answer matters of this consequence. Thus, with the magic being, our swift scene flies in most of no less celerity than that of God. Suppose that you have seen the well appointed king at Dover Pier embark his royalty and his brave fleet with silken streamers, the young Phoebus fanning. Play with your fancies, and in them behold, upon the hempen tackle, ship boys climbing. Grapple your minds to storage of this navy, and leave your England as dead midnight still, guarded by babies, grandsires, and old women. For who is he whose chin is but enriched with one appearing hair that will not follow these cold and choice-drawn cavaliers to France? Work, work your thoughts, and there and see a siege. Behold the ordinance of their carriages with fatal mouths gaping at girded harfleur. Suppose 
the ambassador from the French comes back, tells Harry. 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 <laughs> that the king doth offer him Catherine's oh. daughter. <laughs> Catherine, his daughter, and with her to dowry some petty and unprofitable dukedoms. The offer likes not, and the nibble gunner. With less thought now, the devil is cannon touches! Oh. And down goes all before them. Blast of war blows in our ears. Then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews and summon up the blood. Disguise fair nature with hard, favored rage. Then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noblest English whose blood is fed from father's war from father's thing. Like so many Alexanders, have in these parts for mortal even fought, and sheath their swords for lack of argument. Dishonor not your mothers! Now attest that those who did forget you have to be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. And you, good women, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us know that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game is afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge, cry God for Harry, England, and St. George! <laughs> Achieved our floor till in her ashes she lie buried. The gates of mercy shall be all shut up. Then shall the flesh soldier, with liberty of bloody hand and heart of heart, shall range with conscience wide as hell, mowing like grass your fresh, fair virgins and your flowering infants. What is it then to me if impious swore? Arrayed in the flames like to the prince of fiends, do with his smirched complexion all fell beats, and link to waste and desolation. What rape can hold the senti's wickedness when down the hill he holds his fierce career, as fearfully as sends precepts to the Leviathan to come ashore? Therefore, you men of our floor, take pity of your town and of your people, whilst yet my soldiers are in my command, whilst yet the cool and temperate wind of grace, or blows the filthy and contagious clouds of heady murder, spoil, and villainy. What say you? 
Will you yield in this avoid, or guilty in defense be thus destroyed? Our, <laughs> our expectation hath the same end. The Dauphin, whom of succors we entreated, returns us that his powers are yet not ready to raise so great a siege. Therefore, great king, we yield our town and lives to thy song, mercy. Open our gates, dispose of us and ours, for we are no longer defensible. Open your gates. <laughs> Go you, Uncle Exeter, and enter our floor. There fortify strongly against the French. Use mercy to them for us all, dear uncle. The winter coming and sickness growing upon our soldiers, we will retire unto Calais. Tonight, in our floor, will we be your guest. Tomorrow, for the march, are we addressed. And plainly say that our metal is bred out, and that they will 
give their bodies to the lust of English youth, to new store friends and bastard warriors. They bid us to English dancing schools, saying that our grace is only in our heels, but we are most lofty runaways. Where is Montreux the Herald? To be him hence. Let him greet England with our sharp defiance. Up, princes. And with a spirit of honor edged more sharper than your swords high to the fields. High dukes, great princes, barons, lords, and knights, for your great seats now quit you of great shame. Bar Harry England that sweeps through our land with pennons painted in the blood of our blood. Go down upon him. You have power enough, and in a captive chariot and to ruin bring him our prisoner. This becomes the great. Sorry am I, his numbers are so few, his soldiers sick and famished in their march. For I am sure we shall see our army. He'll banish his heart for the sake of fear, and for achievement offer us his ransom. Therefore, Lord Constable, haste on Montjoy, and let him say to England that we send to know what willing ransom he will give. Prince Gopin, you shall stay with us, Maroon. Not so, I do beseech your majesty. Be patient, for you shall remain with us. Now forth, Lord Constable, and princes all, and quickly bring us word of England's fall. How now, Captain Llewellyn? Come you from the bridge? I can assure you there is very excellent service committed on the bridge. Is the Duke of Exeter safe? Duke of Exeter, the man I love and honor with my soul, my heart, my <laughs> life, and my duty, keeps not. God be praised and blessed, and any heart in the world, but most valiantly keeps the bridge in with excellent position. There is an ancient lieutenant there. I think in my very conscience he is as valiant a man as Mark Antony, and he is a man of no estimation in the world, but I did see him do as gallant service. What do you call him? He is called Ancient Pistol. Uh, I know him not. Captain! <laughs> man. I need the to do me favors. The Duke of Exeter God love thee well. Aye, I praise God. I have merited some love at his hands. Barbara, a soldier, firm and sound of heart, and buxom valor, half by cruel fate and fortune's giddy, furious fickle wheel, and that God is born. Fortune is born off's foe, and he frowns on him, for he hath stolen a pax, and hang it must he be. A damned in death. Let Gallows, gate for dogs, let man go free, let not him, his windpipe suffocate, but Exeter doth give in him the doom of death for bags of little price. Therefore, go, go forth. The Exeter will hear thy voice. Let Bartle's vital thread be not cut with edge of penny cord and vile reproach. Speak, Captain, for his life, and I will thee requite. If, look you, the man of my brother, I would desire the Duke to use his good pleasure and put the man to execution for discipline on his Die and be damned! And be over thy fracture! Why, tis a gall of fool, a rogue, that now and then goes to the wars to hang himself and his return to London in the form of a soldier. Oh, and this they come perfectly in the phrase of war with among ale-washed bottles and foaming wits. But you must learn to know the slanders of the age, or you may be marvelously mistook. I'll tell you what, Captain Gower, I do perceive he is not the man you'd gladly make sure the world he is. <laughs> but if I find a hole in his coat, I'll tell him my mind. Oh, oh, thank you. Oh, the king is coming, oh, and I must speak oh, with him from the fridge. God bless your majesty. And now, Llewellyn, came stuff from the bridge. I so please your majesty, the Duke of Exeter has most gallantly maintained the bridge. The enemy is gone off, look you, and there is gallant the most brave passages. Mary, the adversary blows have possession of the bridge, but is enforced to retire, and the Duke of Exeter is master of the bridge. I can tell your majesty the Duke is a brave man. But men have lost, Llewellyn. The position of the adversary hath been great, a reasonable great. Mary, for my part, I think the Duke has lost never a man but one who is like to be executed for robbing a church, one barred off if you might see another man. We would have all such offenders cut off, and we give express charge that in our marches through the country, nothing be compelled from the villages. 
Nothing taken, but paid for. None of the French upbraided or abused in disdainful language for, when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler gangster is the soonest one. You know me by my habit. Well, then I know thee. What shall I know of thee? My master's mind. Unfold it. Thus says my king, say thou to Harry of England, though he seems dead, we did but sleep. Advantage is a better soldier than rashness. Tell him we could have rebuked him at heart for it, but thought it not good to bruise an injury till we're full ripe. Now we speak upon our cue and our voice is imperial. England shall repent his folly, see his weakness, and admire our sufferance. Bid him therefore to consider for his ransom, which must proportion the losses we have borne, the soldiers we have lost, and the disgraces we have digested, which, in wait to re-answer, his pettiness would bow under. For our losses his exchequer is too poor, for the effusion of our blood the muster of his kingdom too faint a number, and for our disgraces his own person kneeling at our feet but a weak and worthless satisfaction. To this add defiance, and tell him that in conclusion he hath betrayed his followers, whose condemnation is now pronounced. Thus says my king, so much is my office. What is thy name? I know thy quality. My joy. Go therefore. Tell thy king I do not seek him now, but could be willing to march unto Calais without impeachment, for, to say the sooth, tis no wisdom to confess so much unto an enemy of craft and vantage. My people are with sickness much enfeebled. My numbers lessen, and those few I have almost no better than so many French, who, when they were in health, I tell thee, Harold, I thought upon one pair of English legs did march three Frenchmen. Good. Yet, God forgive me that I did brag thus, this your heir of France hath blown that vice in me. I must repent. Go therefore, tell that king, here I am. My ransom? is this frail and worthless trunk, my army but a weak and sickly guard. Yet God before, we will come on, though France and such another neighbor may stand in our way. There's for thy labor, Montjoy. Go bid thy king well advise himself. If we may pass, we will. If we be hindered, we shall your tawny ground with your red blood discolored. And so, Montjoy, fare you well. <laughs> I shall deliver so, thanks to your highness. I hope they will not come upon us now. We are in God's hand now, Gloucester, not in there. Now draw us toward night. Beyond the river we'll encamp ourselves, and on tomorrow give them the march away. <laughs> Such I of us are in all the land, but were they? <laughs> But let my horse have his due. Who's the best horse in Europe? My lord of Orleans and my lord high constable. You talk of horse and armor. Dauphin, you are as well provided of both as any prince in the world. What a long night is this! I will not change my horse with any that treads but on four pastures. So ha! He bounds from the earth, and this his entrails were hairs. Le cheval below the Pegasus, queen of René de Fou. When I bestride him, I soar. I am a hawk. He is pure air and fire. <laughs> Indeed, my lord, is most absolute and excellent horse. It is the prince of palfreys. His nay is like the bidding of a monarch, and his countenance enforces homage. <laughs> no more, cousin. <laughs> nay, the man hath no wit that can bear and deserve and praise on my palfrey. It is a subject for a sovereign to reason on, and for a sovereign, sovereign to ride on. I once read a sonnet in his praise that began thus. Wonder of nature! I have heard a sonnet begin so to one's mistress. Did they, did they imitate that which I composed to my courser? For my horse is my mistress. <laughs> <laughs> even, even as your horse bears your graces, who would trot as well were some of your rags dismounted. Would I were able to load him with his dessert? Will it never be day? I will trot tomorrow a mile, and my way shall be paved with English faces. <laughs> I would not say so, for fear I should be faced out of my own way, but I would it were morning, for I would fain be about the ears of the English. You will go to hazard with me for twenty prisoners. You must first go hazard with yourself to air you have them. Tis midnight. I'll go arm myself. <laughs> the Dauphin longs for morning. He longs to eat the English. I think he will eat all that he kills. <laughs> <laughs> he is simply the most active gentleman of France. Doing his act 
Cynthia, he will still be doing it. But he never did harm that I heard of. Nor will do none tomorrow. He will keep that good name still. Uh, my Lord High Constable, the English lie within 1,500 paces of your tent. Alas, poor Harry of England, he longs not for the dawning as we do. What a wretched and peevish fellow is this King of England to mope with his fat brained followers so far out of his knowledge. If the English had any apprehension, they would run away. <laughs> Foolish curs that run winging into the mouth of a Russian bear and have their heads crushed like rotten apples. <laughs> Come, it is time to arm, shall we about it? It is now two o'clock, but let me see. By ten, we shall have eaten a hundred English again. <laughs>
brothers spoke, commend me to the princes of the camp, do me good morrow to them, and anon desire them all to my pavilion. We shall, my leash. Shall I attend your grace? No. My good knight. Um, go with my brothers to the lords of England. I in my bosom must debate a while, and then I would have no other company. The Lord in heaven bless thee, noble mayor. God of mercy, old heart. I speak as cheerfully. <laughs> Kibula. A friend? Art thou a gentleman or art thou base common upon? I am a gentleman of a company. What are you? As good a gentleman as the emperor. <laughs> oh, then you are better than the king. <laughs> the king's a heart of gold. <laughs> a lad of life, an imp of fame, a fair and skill, and a fist most valiant. I kiss his dirty shoe. And from heartstring, I love the lovely bully. What is thy name? Uh, Harry Leroy. Leroy? A Cornish name, art thou a Cornish oh, group? No, I am a Welshman. No stout well. You tell him I'll knock his leaf about his pate upon St. Davy's sake. Art thou his friend? And his kinsman, too. The thing over you. Oh, and I thank you. God be with you. <laughs> the name is Pistol Cock. Oh, it's worth well with your fierceness. <laughs> ha! Captain Fluellen. So, in the name of Jesu Christ, speak, viewer. It is the great disapparition in the universal world when the true and ancient prerogatives and loss of the wars is not kept. Take the pains to examine the wars of Pompey the Great. You shall find that there is no tittle tattle nor pimple papple in any of Pompey's camp. Look at the wars and the forms of it, and the cares of it, and the ceremonies of it, and the sobriety of it, and the majesty of it to be otherwise. Why, the enemy is loud. You hear him all night. <laughs> if the enemy is an ass, and a fool, and a great thing coxcomb, is it meet, think you, that we should also, look you, be an ass, and a fool, and a great thing, God's going in your conscience now. I will speak lower. I pray you and beseech you that you will. Though it appear a little out of fashion, there is much care and valor in this Welshman. <laughs> Brother John Bates, is not that the morning which breaks yonder? I think it be, but... We have no great cause to desire the approach of day. We see yonder the beginning of the day, but I think we shall never see the end of it. Who goes there? Uh, a friend. Under what captain serve you? Under uh, old Sir Thomas Erpingham. A good old commander and a most kind gentleman. I pray you, what thinks he of our estate? <laughs> Even as men wrapped upon the sand look to be washed off the next tide. He hath not told us all to the king? No. Nor does not me too should, for though I, I speak it to you, I think the king is but a man as I am. The violet smells to him as it doth to me, the element shows to him as it doth to me, all of his senses are but human conditions, and, and though his affections are higher mounted than ours, yet when they stoop, they stoop at a light wing. Therefore, when he sees reason of fears, his fears out of doubt be of the same relish as ours are. Yet in reason, no man should possess him, lest he, by doing so, should dishearten his army. He may show what outward courage he will, but I believe as cold as night as tis. He could wish himself in Thames up to the neck, and I would he were, and I by him, and all the ventures, so we were quit here. By my troth, I will speak. Speak my conscience of the king. I think he would not wish himself anywhere than where he is. And I would he were here alone, as he should be sure to be ransomed in many poor men's lives saved. I dare say you love him not so ill to wish him here alone. Howsoever, you speak this to feel other men's minds. Me Methinks I would not die so contented that in the king's company, his cause being just and his quarrel honorable. That's more than we know. Ah, you're more than we should seek after, for we know we are the king's subjects. If his cause be wrong, our obedience to the king lights the crime of it out of us. But if the cause be not good, the king himself hath a heavy reckoning to make. 
when all those legs and arms and heads chopped off in a battle shall join together at the latter day and cry all, we die at such a place, some swearing, some crying for a surgeon, some upon their wives left poor behind them, some upon the debts they owe, some upon their children, rawly left. I am afeard. There are few die well that die in a battle. For how can they charitably dispose of anything when blood is their argument? Now, if these men do not die well, it will be a black matter for the king that led them to it, who to disobey were against all proportion of subjection. So if a son, that is, by his father sent about merchandise to sinfully miscarry upon the sea, and the imputation of his wickedness by your rule should be imposed upon the father's son that sent him. Now, if these men have defeated the law and outrun native punishment, though they can outstrip men, they have no wings to fly from God. War is his beetle. War is his vengeance. And here, men are punished for before breach of the king's laws, and now the king's quarrel. To every subject's duty is the king's, yet every subject's soul is his own. Tis certain every man that dies ill the ill upon his own head. The king is not to answer to it. I do not desire that he should answer for me, but I determined to fight lustily for him. I myself heard the king say he would not be ransomed. I! He said so to make us fight cheerfully. But when our throats are cut, he may be ransomed, and we ne'er the wiser. If I ever live to see it, I will never trust his word thereafter. That's a perilous shot out of an elder gun that a poor and a private displeasure can do against a monarch. Your reproof is something too round. I should be angry with you if the time were convenient. Let it be a quarrel between us, if you live. Oh, I embrace it. How shall I know you again? Give me any gauge of thine. If thou darest acknowledge it, I will make it my quarrel. There. Whoever thou come to me and say, this is my glove, I will take thee a box on the nose. Oh, if I ever live to see it, I will challenge it. Thou darest as well be paid. Oh, then I will do it then, even in the king's company. <laughs> Keep thy word. Fare thee well. Be friends, you English fools. Be friends. We have French quarrels enough, I to reckon. Oh, indeed. The French may lay 20 French crowns to one. They will beat us, for they bear it on their shoulders. But it is no English treason to cut French crowns, and tomorrow, the king himself will be a clipper! Upon the king, let us, our lives, our souls, our deaths, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king! We must bear all. Subject to the breath of every fool who sins no more can feel but his own ringing. What infinite mercies must kings neglect that private men enjoy? And, and what have kings that privates have not to save ceremony? Oh, save general ceremony. What art thou, thou idol of ceremony? Oh, ceremony, show me but thy worth. Art thou aught else but place, degree, and form, creating awe and fear in other men, where then thou art less happy being feared than in fearing drinks thou oft instead of homage sweet, but poison flattery. Oh, be sick, great greatness, and, and, and bid thy ceremony give me cure. No. 
not all these. Thrice gorgeous ceremony, no! Not all these, laid in bed majestical, can sleep. So soundly as the wretched slave, with a vacant mind and a body full, gets him dressed, never sees hard night. What watch the king keeps to maintain the peace? Whose hours the peasants' best advantages? My lord, your nobles, jealous of your absence, seek for your camp to find you. Good old knight. Commend them all to my tent. I'll be before thee. I shall do it, my lord. Steal my soldiers' hearts, possess them not with fear, to take from them now the sense of reckoning. covetous for gold, but if it be a sin to covet honor, 
I am the most offending soul alive. <coughs> oh, God's peace, do not wish one more. Rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach in this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall see this day and live old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, Tomorrow is day, Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars. Old men forget. Yet all shall be forgot, but he will remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our hands, familiar in his mouth as household words be in their flowing cups, freshly remembering. This story shall the good man teach his son, and crisp and crispy and shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. We in it shall be remembered. of brothers. We band of sisters. For she today that sheds her blood with me shall be my sister. And, and gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed. They were not here. And, and hold their manhoods. Chief Wells in East speaks that fought with us on St. Crispin's Day. Myself and Lord, bestow yourself with speech. The French are bravely in their battle set with all expedients will charge on us. All things are ready if our minds be so. Paris the man's mind is backward now. You know your places. God be with you all. Once more I come to know thee, King Harry, and for thy ransom that will come down. Certainly, thou art so near the gulf, and needs must be in blood. Besides, the gospel which thee thou wilt teach thy followers repentance, for their sweet and oh, peaceful overthrow from off the field where wretched their bodies must lie in such Who hath sent thee now? The constable of I pray thee, bear my former answer back. Bid them achieve me and then sell my bones. Good God. Why should they mock poor fellows thus? Those that leave their valiant bones in France, dying like men though buried in your dung hills, they shall be buried. And there the sun shall reap them, drawing their honors, reeking up to heaven, leaving their earthly parts to choke your climb, the smell whereof shall breed a plague in France. Let me speak proudly. Tell your constable we are but warriors for the working day. Our gayness and our guilt are all besmirched with painful marching in the rainy field. But by the mass, our hearts are in the trim, and my poor soldiers tell me, yet ere night, they'll be in fresher robes. Save thou thy labor, Harold. Come no more for ransom, gentle Harold. They shall have none. So tell your constable. I will, King Mary, and so fare thee well. Thou will not hear Harold's voice. Oh, I fear thou wilt come again for ransom. My lord, most humbly on my knee I beg the leading of the favor. Take it, Rachel. Come, now, soldiers, march away. If thou pleases, go. Dispose the day. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Do thou should.
senior do thou? Dias, by point of box, accept, O senior. Thou do give to me egregious ransom. Give me crowns, give me brave crowns, or mangled shalt thou be. Gardez ma vie et ne du donere du sense couche. Ma'am, what are his words? Your horsemen on yon hill. If they will fight with us, bid them come here and avoid the field. If they do neither, we will come to them. They do offend our sight. Besides, not a man of them that we shall take shall taste our mercy. Go and tell them so. Travel 
license that we may book our dead and then to bury them, to sort our nobles from our common men. For many princes woe the while I drowned in soap and mercenary blood. So do our vulgar drench their peasant limbs and blood of the princes. I give us leave, great king, to view the field in safety to book our dead and to bury them. I tell thee truly, Harold, I know not if the day be ours or no. The day is close. Must be God, and not our strength for it. What is the castle called that, that stands hard by? They call it Agincourt. Then uh, <laughs> call we this the field of Agincourt, fought on the day of Crispin Crispianus. Your grandfather and your great uncle Edward, your majesty, and please you as I have read in the chronicles of Motobos, brave battle here in France. They did well. <laughs> and if your majesty is remembered of the Welshmen did good service. <laughs> Thanks good my countryman. I am your majesty's countryman. I care not who know it. Oh, so long as your majesty is an honest. Oh, God, keep me so. <laughs> our herald, go with them. Bring me just notice of numbers dead on both our parts. Your Majesty, in my conscience. <laughs> well, it may be. This his enemy is a gentleman of great sort, quite from his answer to his degree. Well, oh, he'd be as good a gentleman as the devil is, as Lucifer, and the Beelzebub himself. It is necessary, look, Your Grace, that he keep his vow and his oath. Then keep thy vow, Sirrah, when thou meets the fellow. So I will, my liege, as I live. Who serves thou under? Under Captain Gower, my liege. Go call him hither to me, soldier. So I will, my liege. Here. Llewellyn, take this glove. When Alan saw and myself bore down, I took this glove from his helm. If any man challenges this, he is a friend to Alan saw and an enemy to our person. If any man encounter such, apprehend him and Thou dost me love. Your Majesty does me great honor as it can be desired in the hearts of his subjects. Knowest thou, Gower? He is my dear friend, and please you. I pray thee, go seek him and send him to my tent. I will fetch him. Oh. <laughs> my Lord of Bethany, my brother Gloucester, the glove which I have given him may happily purchase him a box of the ear. Follow Llewellyn closely at the heels. It is the soldiers! <laughs> I, I by bargain should wear it myself, for some sudden mischief may arise from it, for I do know Llewellyn Valiant. Follow. Go you with me, Exeter. I warrant this tonight, you captain. God's will and his pleasure, captain. I beseech you now, come apace to the king. There is more good toward your free adventurer than is in your knowledge to dream of. Sir, know you this glove? Know the glove? I know the glove is a glove. <laughs> <laughs> I know this, and thus I challenge it. Spot! An added traitor as any in the universal world, or in France, or in England. How now, sir, you villain? Do you think I'll be for sworn? Stand away, Captain Gower, all trees in his payment and applause. I warrant. I you. am no traitor. Ha! That's a lie in thy throat. Apprehend him. He's a friend of the 
Duke Ellen Sons. How now, how now, what's the matter? My lord of Bedford, here is, pray speak God for it, a most contagious treason come to light. How, how now, what's the matter? My liege, here is, a most arrant villain that hath struck the glove which your majesty is take out of the helmet of Alan's son. My leash, this was my glove. Here is the fellow I have promised to strike if he wore it, and I've been as good as my word. Give me thy glove, soldier. Look, here's the fellow of it. Twas I indeed thou promised to strike, and thou hast given me most bitter terms. All offenses, my lord, come from the heart. It never came any from mine that might offend your majesty. It was ourself thou didst abuse. Your majesty came not like yourself. You appeared to me but as a common man. Witness the night your garments, your loathiness, and what your highness suffered under that shape. I beseech you, take it for your own fault and not mine. For had you been as I took you, for I made no offense. Therefore I beseech your highness, pardon me. <laughs> Here, Exeter, fill this glove with crowns and give it to this fellow. Keep it, fellow, and wear it as an honor till I do challenge it. Give him the crowns. Well, then, you must needs be friends with him. I will none of your money. I can tell you it is with a good will. It will serve you to mend your shoes. Come, wherefore should you be so bashful? Your shoes is not so good. <laughs> Are the dead numbered, Harold? Here is the number of the slaughter of French. Duke of Orléans, Duke of Bourbon, of other lords and barons, knights and squires, full fifteen hundred besides common men. This note doth tell me of ten thousand French in the field slain, knights bearing banners, gallantry. Where's the number of your English dead? Edward, the Duke of York, the Earl of Suffolk. Uh, none else of name. And, and all other men, but five and twenty. When, when without strategy was there ever so great and little loss on one part and the other? God, for it is none but thine. Come, go we in procession to the village, and be it death proclaimed to boast of this or to take pride from God. Do we all holy rites? The dead with charity enclosed in clay, and, and then, then to Calais, in England then. We're now from France, arrived more happy men. Does fortune play the hot swipe with me? News of I that my wife is dead in a hospital of a malady of France. There, my rendezvous is quite cut off. Old I do wax, and from my weary limbs, honor is cudgel. Well, bod I'll turn. Something lean to cut purse with quick hand. To England will I steal, and there I'll steal. Thou chafe to those that have not read this story that I may prompt them. And, and of such as have, I humbly pray them to admit the excuse of time, of numbers, and due course of things which cannot in their huge and proper life be here presented. Now we bear the king towards Calais, grant him there. There see, he who way upon your winged thought of forth the sea. Behold! The English beach pales in the flood with men wise. And boys who shouts and claps on boys to be To London, the insect to London. See London doth pour out her citizens. The mayor and all his brethren best sword to the senators of the antique Rome, with the plebeians swarming at their heels, go and fetch their 
Bruce Caesar in. Did they this Harry? Then brook abridgment and in your eyes advance. After your thoughts, straight back again to France. <laughs> Peace to this meeting. King and Queen of France, health and fair time of day. Joy and good wishes to our most fair and princely cousin Catherine. And as a branch and member of his royalty, by whom this great assembly is contrived, we do salute you, Duke of Burgundy. And princes, French, and peers, help to you all. Right joyous are we to behold your face, most worthy brother England, fairly met. And you, princes English, everyone. So happy be the issue of this day, as we are now glad to behold your eyes. Your eyes, which hitherto hath borne them against the French, that met them in their bent, the fatal balls of murdering basilisks. The venom of such looks, we fairly hope, hath lost their quality, and that this day shall change all griefs and quarrels into love. You English princes all, I do salute you. My due to you both on equal love, great kings of France and England. I have labored by my majesty to bring you into this royal bar interview. Since then, my office hath prevailed that face to face and royal eye to eye we have congreed. Let it not disgrace thee if I demand to know why that poor mangled peace should not in this best garden of the world, our fertile France, put up her lovely visage. In all the vineyards, fallows, meads, and hedges, defective in their natures look to wildness. Even so, our houses and ourselves and children have lost or do not learn for want of time. The science is that should become our country, but we're like savages, that soldiers will do nothing but meditate on blood. My speech entreats no by that gentle peace should not expel these former qualities and bless us. If, Duke of Burgundy, you would the peace whose wants give growth to the imperfections which you have cited, you must buy that peace with full accord to all our just demands, whose tenors and particular effects you have in scheduled briefly in your hands. The king hath heard them, as to the which yet there is no answer made. Why, then the peace which you before so urge lies in his answer. I have, but with the curse of eye or glance the articles. Please, if your grace, to appoint some of your council presently to sit with us with better heed, and we will suddenly pass our accept and preemptory answer. Brother, we shall. Go, Uncle Exeter, and Brother Gloucester, go with the king, and take with you free power to ratify as or augment as your wisdom shall best the advantage before our dignity. And we'll co-sign there, too. Fair sister, will, fair sister, will you go with the princes or stay here with us? Our gracious brother, I will go with them. Happily, a, a woman's, woman's voice will do some good when articles too nicely urged be stood on. <coughs> Yet leave our cousin Catherine. She is our... Capital demand comprised within the four ranks of our article. She has to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Most fair, Catherine, will you vouchsafe to teach a soldier term so much that will enter at a lady's ear and plead his gentle love suit to her heart? In your majesty shall mock at me. I cannot speak your England. If thou canst love me soundly with your French heart, I will be glad to hear you confess it with your broken English. Dost thou like me, Kate? Well, then, I cannot tell what is like me. An angel is like you, Kate, and you are like an angel. I said so, and I must not blush to affirm it. Oh, bon Dieu, les langues des sont what says she, fair one, that the tongues of men are full of deceits? We? <laughs> <laughs> the princess is the better English woman. If faith, Kate, I am glad thou canst understand no better English. For if thou couldst, thou wouldst think I was a plain king. Thou wouldst think I had sold my farm to buy my crown. <laughs> I know no ways to mince it in love, but to directly say I love you. And you would urge me farther than to say, do you, to faith? I wear out my suit, give me thy answer. To faith do, and so love hands in a bargain. What space thou, my love? So both I know me understand well. Mary, if, if you would put me to verses or to dance for thy sake, why you have undone me. For the one I have neither words nor 
or measure, or the other, I have no strength in measure, yet a reasonable measure in strength. <laughs> yet before God, I must not look greenly nor gasp out my eloquence, nor have I no cunning in protestation. Only downright those, which I never use to urge, and never break for urging. I come to thee plain soldier, if thou canst love me for this. If not, to say that I would die is true, and yet for thy love by the Lord know. Yet I love thee too, and while thou livest, take, take a fellow of plain and uncoined constancy. If thou canst take such a one, take, take me, take a soldier, take a soldier, take a king. What sayst thou, my lady? Speak, my fair, and fairly, I pray thee. Is it possible that I should love the enemy of France? No, oh. it is not. Oh, <laughs> no, it is not possible you should love the enemy of France, Kate. By loving me, you should love the friend of France. For I love France so much that I will not part with a village of it. And Kate, when France is mine and I'm yours, then France is yours and you are mine. No! <laughs> I cannot tell what is that. No, then I will tell thee in French, which I'm sure will hang upon my neck like a new married wife, but her husband never be shook off. Je crois sur la position de France. Je crois sur la position de France. Let's see, let's see. Et vous avez et France, et et vous et et mia 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 mia. I can easier conquer a kingdom, Kate, than uh, Kate than speak so much more French. Pour ça non, ne pensez que vous parlez que les mesures de que l'anglais je parle. It is so, Kate. And by thy speaking of my tongue and I thine, most truly, falsely, must needs be presented to be much in one. Canst thou understand thus much English? Canst thou love me? How answer you? La plus belle Catherine du Montre et cher de Vendessi. Your Majesty, how false French enough to deceive the most sage demoiselle that is en France. I love thee, Kate. Come, thy answer in broken music, for thy voice is music, and thy English is broken. It is as it shall please the one on there. Nay, it shall please him, Kate, it shall please your father. Then it shall also consent to me. Upon that, I kiss your hand. <laughs> deny a naked blind boy her naked seeing self? It were my lord a hard condition for a maid to consign to. Yet they do wink and yield as love is blind and it forces. And they don't know what they do and they are excused. Then good my lord, teach your cousin's consent winking. I will wink on her to consent if you will teach her my meaning. It is so. And you may, some of you, thank love for my blindness, so it cannot see so many a French city for one fair French maid that stands in my way. You see them prospectively. 
The cities turned into a maid, for they are all girdled with maiden walls that war hath never entered. <laughs> Shall Kate be my wife? So please you. I am contented, and so the maiden cities you speak of may wait on her. And the maiden that stood in the way of my wish shall show me the way to my will. We have consented to all terms of reason. It is so, my lord. The king hath granted every article, his daughter first, and in sequel all, according to their firm proposed natures. And thereupon give me your daughter. <coughs> Take her, fair son, and from her blood raise up issue to me that the two contending <coughs> kingdoms of France and England may cease their hatred. Now welcome, Kate, and bear witness all as I kiss her as my sovereign queen. Prepare we for our marriage, on which day combine our hearts as one, our realms as one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 